The Committee on Ways and Means will now come to order. Uh, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Chairman McGurl. Here. Vice Chair Lavasco. Aye. Representatives Bland Manlove. Present. Coleman. Eggleston. Here. Mayhew. Pfeiffer. Here. Riggs. Aye. Roden. Here. Weber. Uh, we have a quorum. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is, is we're going to go into uh, uh, executive session, and I'm going to hear uh, House Bill 1905, and then we'll, we'll go back into public hearing. So uh, with that, uh, I move that House Bill 1905 be voted due pass. Any discussion? Seeing none, okay, let me have that a second here, okay. I have a substitute that has been distributed and I move for its adoption. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting the substitute signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, all those who oppose say no. The ayes have it. I, you have adopted the substitute. Now I move that the House Committee substitute for House Bill 1905 be voted due pass. Do I have any discussion? Uh, Representative Manlove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what are the changes that we're making? Does anybody want to discuss that? Uh, the, yes, uh, I would request uh, Representative Shaw to come up and give a brief uh, description of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee. Uh, <clears throat> most of the changes are what we talked about last week. Uh, we included charitable organizations, donations, uh, the charitable organizations as well. And then we also made the change uh, after looking at the language, we want to make sure that if we exempted it from sales tax, it didn't fall into the use, use tax category. So we made those changes to both, um, let me find the uh, sections, uh, 144.011, we made the changes there, and then also to 030 to make sure that one, when that food's spoiled, it's not going to be charged sales tax, then it's also not going to be charged under the use tax as well. So it just tightens it up. Okay, so yeah, I remember those requests from um, the use tax was from the CPAs, and then the, mm -hmm. um, and then um, what was the other part? The the retail, the charitable portion. Charitable, that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, please call the roll. Chairman McGroom. Aye. <clears throat> Vice Chair Lavasco. Aye. Representatives Bland Manlove. Aye. Coleman. Aye. Eggleston. Mayhew, Aye. Pfeiffer, Aye. Riggs, Aye. Roden, Aye. Weber. Aye. By your vote of nine to zero, you vote uh, do pass on House Bill 1905 has substituted. Nine to zero. Now we will go back into public hearing, and we will hear House Bill 1480 by Representative Dinkins. Uh, Representative, uh, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, for the record, Representative Chris Dinkins, District 144. Uh, this bill I have previously presented and it actually passed out of the House, and um, when we shut down for the pandemic. Uh, it died over in the Senate, and we've been having trouble getting it back through on the Senate, so here I am again. Um, this bill prevents the money that it re was received into the Iron County School Fund from uh, the administrative order from being subtracted from the calculation of the local effort. 
and it does have an emergency clause in it because, as I said before, we have been working on this since 2020, and it's failed to get across the finish line. Now, the summary that I just went over, what that means is back in 2019, the local lead mining company in my district uh, was fined $1.2 million uh, by the Department of Natural Resources. And the administrative order said that that money was to be paid to the Iron County School Fund. So they specified in the court order where the money was to be paid to. But because of the way the local calculation effort is set up through DESE, that gets subtracted out when they turn in their paperwork. So basically they get nothing even though this was in the court order that they should be receiving it. So all we're trying to do is to uh, put the money back where it was intended to go from the administrative order. Um, years ago, former Senator Engler and uh, Representative Fitzwater had a similar bill that had to be done from because of another administrative order that was placed. So uh, this is not anything that hasn't been done before, but it is something that we are trying to correct. Um, this. This fine was to be paid in increments, so two of the increments have already been paid, and we have lost out on that money. And so all we're trying to do is to recoup the rest before um, before the final payments are made. And with that, I'll take any questions. Uh, uh, Representative, uh, what uh, are do you have a, any amount of the funds that you're uh, uh, talking about here for these uh, payments? Uh, the payments were to be paid in $400,000 increments, and that was to be done over a three-year period. However, when the pandemic hit, uh, the Doe Run Company went back and asked DNR, since we had been working on the bill and it had passed out of the house, if they would uh, postpone the payment plan, and they did that at that time so that we could try and recoup this money for the local school districts. Okay. Now, will that affect uh, Arcadia and South Iron, or is this just... Um, so it would be like by Burnham, Arcadia, Bellevue, um, South Iron, and probably a few of the kids that go to Valley okay. are, are included in the Iron County. They have formula that they use. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Representative Weber? Uh, proceed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, lady, for bringing this back. Um, just... A really quick question. Well, first off, thank you for uh, saying it was Doe Run. That was one of my questions. I was going to ask you if it was Doe Run. And then also, um, we heard this last session, right? Was it in Gin Laws? I believe so. Yeah, okay. And it passed unanimously out of Gin Laws? Mm -hmm. And then just died? Right. Yeah. We've been having that issue lately. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Uh, Rep Representative Riggs? To inquire. Uh, proceed. Thank you. Um, you said this has happened before. What stops this from happening again? So we fix it this time. Is there any way basically to put a stop to this, say we're not going to do this anymore? Um, I had two separate bills when I first did that to, uh, to fix it permanently and one to fix the immediate one. And there were some people that had some opposition to the permanent fix. They said that they would have rather address them on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Roden? To inquire briefly. Proceed. Was this constituents or lobbyists? Who was the ones that would like to take this on a case by pace? Members. Case. Okay, members of the body. Okay, thank you. Any further questions for this representative? Uh, seeing none, thank you. Yep. Do I have any individuals here to speak in favor of House Bill 1480. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, uh, thank you for testifying. And also, I want to remind everyone to be sure, I didn't do this at start, but remind you to fill out your witness form and put it on the table if you haven't already submitted it online. So be sure and do that. All right. Uh, any further witnesses on in favor of House Bill 1480? Seeing none. Any witnesses here in opposition to House Bill 
1480. See none? Any witnesses here for informational purposes only on House Bill 1480? Seeing none, that will conclude the hearing on House Bill 1480. Thank you, Representative. All right. Uh, the next uh, bill that we will hear will be House Bill 2200. Two two zero zero. Do I have uh, the representative here? Mm -mm. Do I have uh, for House Bill twenty two o eight? Uh, seeing none. Nobody. Okay, uh, the next one we will hear will be HJR 125. Do I have the representative here for that bill or for that uh, joint resolution? They are, they are not here. Uh, just one second here. All right, since uh, we had some no-shows, uh, no-show there, uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to go back into executive session. And uh, at this time, uh, I will... move that House Bill 1992 be voted due pass. Any discussion? Okay. All right. I have an amendment <coughs> that has been distributed. Uh, 0.02H, and it has been distributed, and I move for its adoption. Any discussion? And what I would... Uh, so, do, on, on the amendment. The, yes. Uh, Representative, would you like to explain your amendment? Okay, it's just a, it's amending, uh, I'll read it, it just amends the title and enacting the clause uh, and some intersectional references. references. So, uh, so seeing, uh, do I have any discussion? Seeing none. I, oh, uh, so all those in favor of adopting the House Amendment Point zero two H uh, signify who's signifying by saying yes. Those in the opposed say no. The ayes have it. You have adopted the amendment. Any further discussion? Representative Roden. I have an amendment ending in point zero three H. It's been distributed. I move for its adoption. Uh, what? Any discussion? 
Yes, I, I, I would uh, like to discuss the amendment. I do have a uh, the question, Representative. Okay. Have you... Uh, so would you like for me to explain the amendment? Yes, if you would, please. Okay, so last week we talked about uh, the food items and what we're reducing the 1.225% on. This would uh, amendment would take it to um, basically foods approved by the Women, Infant, and Children Special Supplemental Nutrition, nutrition Program so that we're making sure that we're reducing the taxes only on nutritious valued foods such as milk, uh, fruits, vegetables, anything approved under the WIC program, uh, along with um, some of the clauses under 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9. Um, that is the uh, hot meals as well for Meals on Wheels for our seniors and uh, the disabled who aren't able to fully prepare the food itself. So it would remove that tax from those individuals as well um, and on on frozen food items that are approved through the WIC program. So um, this would take it down to the nutritional valued foods only. So we'd get rid of the frozen food, frozen burrito, and the donut situation at the gas stations and, and whatnot that probably shouldn't be uh, exempted from this from the sales tax. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, uh, Representative, I do have a question. Uh, have you discussed this amendment? I have not discussed this with the, the bill sponsor. Uh, and uh, why has, I mean, is there a particular reason? I haven't discussed it with the bill sponsor. It's a priority of a, as a member of the House of Representatives in, in the committee process, and that's why we uh, just actually got the amendment drafted this morning, so. Okay. Well, uh, Representative Pfeiffer? Yes, a, a question. Do you, do you know what the fiscal impact of this particular version would be? So it actually lessen the fiscal impact yeah. because we're not we're not exempting things like the burrito, the gas station burrito, the donuts. So so it actually even yeah. lower the the fiscal note. When it increased the fiscal note, it would actually lower it because yeah. we're gonna to make sure that we're actually going towards nutritious foods that have a good value for people that they yeah. should be eating. Yeah, I, I like it. So. And, and you know, my own personal point of view is I would really like to vote for this. I'm very concerned about the impact on schools. So I was just wondering if you had so, an, an idea about what it would be. So because of the other previous amendment, this only affects the 1.225% on state revenue. Right. Uh, the previous amendment took out everything from the school side. So that's what the O2 amendment did. So it got rid of all the local sales tax issues. Uh, so we don't impact that issue. This uh, then only applies to that 1.225% that we collect on the state level that she was trying to get to anyways. And this further says that that 1.225% will only be collected on uh, on basically the frozen pizzas, the, the donuts, the, the frozen burritos, anything that's not approved under the WIC that's actually considered healthy. The stuff that tastes really good but it's not good for us. I get it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Any further questions for this? Oh, uh, Representative Lavasco, sorry. Uh, that's all right. Thank I you. I, I'm, you I'm in the corner, and I've been bouncing around. Uh, uh, proceed. <laughs> so I, I think I understand the, the intent here. Uh, I don't really like the concept of government choosing what kinds of things to promote or discourage. Uh, I think, you know, you and I probably might agree on what's healthy and what's not. Uh, I recognize we already do a certain amount of that through the, the program as it is, and so this isn't necessarily, you know, some new ground. Uh, that said, you know, from a simplicity stake, you know, certainly dealing with, you know, the, the efforts that the retail organizations are going to have to deal with, having different tax rates for different items, that sort of thing. I just assume keep it simple, uh, especially if we haven't had time to really go over this with the bill sponsor. I, I think this is probably so a discussion the, we might want to have on the floor rather than now once we've kind of so, so looked the issue the with um, the issue that you're trying to bring up, we're still going to have a separate 4.225 versus a 1.225 argument. Well, well but I mean, because, that's going to be the be, case. Because on the argument still falls on, is it a hot or cold food item? And sure. the representative's bill only affects cold items non-prepared items such as the gas station burrito. Right, but I mean, I think Don't generally that's... speaking, we can, and that's it's, why it's pretty I'm... easy to determine what food is, uh, at so, least from an so, objective standpoint. So <laughs> we're, we're, if, if we're, we're already talking about we would collect the 4.225, we're not adding any extra pressure or, or onto the, the build or onto the businesses because we're already doing that with the hot item. So if the gas station heats up that burrito, it's still, it's charged at 4.225 versus the 1.225. 
Um, and this one, we're si simply saying that if we're going to actually reduce under the premise that we're doing something for low income that are that are needing healthy, nutritious items, that this is supposed to be for life saving or life altering, um, substantiating foods, then maybe we should tailor that to actual foods that are beneficial to the to people's systems instead of were we to make that decision uh, well we <laughs> we make that with WIC program and that's why we didn't go through individually and try to list out uh, because the the WIC program has already said this is the stuff that helps support women infant and children uh, that's supplemental and that that's nutritious so we, we've already have a program that's set up to assist what is what is healthy and what is not or what is considered luxury items and and in all honesty if you're buying a gas station burrito for five bucks we're talking about saving five cents um that's yeah, a, no, it's not that, a, huge that's a luxury money, item that's not yeah. a that's not a life-sustaining food that we. Should i think be. you'd agree the vast majority of food that's sold in the state is not at gas stations though you'd probably yeah, be surprised on that one what the the revenue is collected off of casey's and qt's and Everything else. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that it's a non-zero number. And I, I do think that this would help the fiscal note. I agree with you there. I just, yeah. I think this is a larger conversation and, and to kind of have well, this that's why we're, during exec yeah. session might not be the, the best place for well, it. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, this is actually surprisingly or not, this is where we're supposed to have these debates. And this is where we're supposed to put good forth legislation through the committee process first. Sure. So, And I don't object to that in, in principle. I, I'm with you there. I just... This is a and, and if, departure from what we're doing in the bill generically. No, that's not how we. It's it's actually just simplifying to make sure that it's it's a a set program. We already make that distinction between hot and cold items um, with the four point two two five and versus one point two two five. We're talking about getting rid of the one point two two five, and we're just saying now that we're going to differentiate between nutritious foods versus non nutritious. So it doesn't have any value. But then so, why just with the WIC things and not you know? Because those are supple those are food items that have instead of going through and sitting there and say every every fruit, every vegetable, every canned fruit, every canned vegetable, every frozen fruit, and listing out every single item, women, infant, children, supplemental nutrition already list those out, and we already have a, 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 a list to fall back on so we don't have to cloud the, the, the books with information on what we consider and what we don't. We're regulating it through a regulatory agency that already has set up that this is good enough for the, for women, infant, and children for supplemental that we provide funding for. That's I, why I guess I'm asking the from the perspective of a person in a grocery store. Uh, they're not familiar with any of this, and this is – you're going to suggest that the, the stores maybe have different colored labels to tell people uh, what they're paying tax on what they're Have not. you gone grocery shopping lately? <laughs> if you go to any place, it's – most grocery stores, they all have the little thing. It says yeah, WIC no, approved. That's what that means, I, WIC approved. So. But the, the, the point, though, is we're trying to, to – apply this to the largest and most equally distributed population as possible rather than, you know, kind of picking and choosing who we're going to gonna favor, right? And no, we're not picking or choosing and favoring anybody. We're just saying if, if you're going to be – if we're going to reduce the tax on this, let's make it reduced on healthy food items versus frozen pizzas. I think if you're a manufacturer burritos. of junk food, you might disagree with that. Well, I'm, I'm sure they <laughs> would, but if we're going to cut the state's budget and we're going to have a financial impact on the state, then, you know – Maybe we should look at what we actually sit here and reduce the taxes on. I, I'm with you on, on the fiscal side. I just I don't like government picking sides. Again, so I'll, I'll bring up the here. other way of it is if you look at it, if a person spending a thousand dollars a month in groceries, twelve thousand dollars a year, what this bill is doing right now is taking roughly one hundred and forty seven dollars and giving it back to you. Sure. No, I recognize it's not a huge it's, impact, but no, it's not a huge impact you know, at all. You're making it more complicated, is I think uh, adding another layer to this that we have to administer. So I, I think I think we're just going to disagree on this. It's not okay. a big deal. Uh, I think we'll move forward and go okay. from there. Thanks, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think also, I, you know, I'd like to say something. Uh, I kind of, you know, I agree since uh, this bill, this amendment was not discussed prior with the bill sponsor, and. In addition, uh, this looks like something because it is still it's kind of vague, I, I think. And so I think what that would be a good discussion uh, to be carried on on the floor. So do I have any other discussion on the bill? And so I will I will not be supporting it and I will urge the committee not to support it. So with uh, with that, do I have any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting House Amendment Number 2, signify by saying yes or aye. Aye. 
All those opposed say no. 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 The Chair, I'd like for a roll call vote, please. Yes, oh, 03. Uh, oh. Mr. Chairman, would you please call the roll? Chairman McGurl? No. Vice Chair Lavasco? No. Representatives Bland Manlove? Yes. Coleman? Yes. Eggleston? Yes. Mayhew? Pfeiffer? Yes. Riggs? Yes. Roden? Aye. Weber? Aye. Coleman? <laughs> Can we call the absentees? <laughs> okay. All right. What I uh, We will be on hold here for. Okay, uh, the Ways and Means Committee will now stand at ease for just a moment. Yeah, right. We're going to go ahead and we're going to. Five to three. Go ahead. Okay. okay. By your vote of, of five to three, you have voted to do pass uh, House Amendment 2. I move that we roll the amendment into the, no, this is into the bill, isn't it? Right. I, I move that we uh, roll the amendment into a new sub and adopt this, the substitution. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. The ayes have it. Uh, you have adopted the substitute. I move that House Committee substitute uh, for House Bill 1992 be voted due pass. 
Any discussion? Please call the roll. Chairman McGurl? Aye. Vice Chair Lavasco? Aye. <clears throat> Representatives Bland Manlove? Coleman? Aye. Eggleston? Mayhew? Pfeiffer? Aye. Riggs? Aye. Roden? Aye. Weber? By your vote of seven to zero, you have voted do pass for a House committee substitute for our House Bill 1992. Do pass. We will know, now go back into public hearing and we will hear House Bill 2208 by Representative Chris Finelli. Ah, we found you, uh, Representative. <laughs> sure. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My apologies, members of the committee. I had the wrong time uh, in my mind uh, for this hearing, but I I'm glad I caught you. So I am here to present House Bill 2208. Uh, this is a bill that uh, this committee has heard before. I think the first time was two years ago. Uh, it was passed out unanimous at that time. It's passed out of uh, several Senate committees uh, unanimously in the past, uh, and um, it's a pretty simple and straightforward change. Uh, the problem we face is that uh, we have across our state uh, different methodologies for depreciating uh, the types of um, infrastructure that are used to move uh, gases and, and water uh, through our utility systems. And uh, when different depreciation schedules are used by different county assessors, uh, that dramatically changes um, the, the uh, costs to the end consumer uh, because when you accelerate that, that depreciation schedule, you bring in uh, more, more revenue faster. And so there's a perverse incentive on the behalf of some, uh, some assessors across the state to um, accelerate those faster than, uh, than other, other counties are doing it. And so uh, when that happens, uh, those costs, uh, those in, uh, increased costs are socialized uh, across the entire uh, district. And so um, consumers in one area of the state are, are bearing uh, the cost of that in accelerated depreciation schedule. Uh, that uh, they had no control over in a, in a different part of the state. So my uh, solution to that is that we have uh, one statewide depreciation schedule for this type of equipment, uh, and um, it is uh, the kind we use for tangible personal property. And so that would uh, apply uniformly across the state and, um, and prevent uh, this problem from, from occurring in the future. Uh, I think uh, that it's a pretty common sense change. I will caution you, I'm happy to entertain questions, but I am not a, a tax lawyer. Uh, so um, um, we do have an expert witness that is going to testify uh, that is a tax lawyer uh, and, and can deal with some of the more technical questions. As if you have those, we will also have representatives from the, the water and gas industry who can explain some of the problems they've seen occur across the state. And if there are no further questions, uh, I would appreciate uh, your, your consideration in favor of this bill. Okay, do I have uh, any discussion any for this witness? Yes, I, I will reserve my questions then for your, for your witnesses, uh, Representative. Thanks for testifying. Uh, do I have any witnesses that are testifying in favor of House Bill 2208. Be sure and put your witness form on, on the table, or if you haven't filed it online, uh, state your name, and you can begin when you're ready.
Uh, would you would you please state your name for the record? I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Continue, please. Or a structure, they're not a structure, they're, okay. yeah. Another reason why this is logically grounded, other states act in Missouri prior to an amendment in Since the State Tax Commission recommended this decision, the vast majority of counties in the state, the question is, why, why the change? What's the problem? Well, as the representative mentioned, there are a few outlier county assessments. without representation, fundamentally unfair, and those same would resolve any question as to the extent of all in favor of a of the statutory depreciation Is that better? Representative Mayhew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, um, so um, I got a couple of questions for you. Um, the propane is specifically excluded. 
well, however, it's a storage device. I probably wouldn't call it transportation. So why was LP taken out? My recollection is that was taken out during the first year that this bill was up. Um, and I, 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 my guess is that the lobby had, had didn't want to be involved in the change. I, I don't know the specific. Aha. <laughs> now, um, so that brings us to the next question. Um, what's um, Obviously, we're not talking about uh, interstate pipelines, right, because they're t handled under that ICC. Central assessment. Yeah, yep. central assessment. Uh, thank you. Um, so do you have a um, an opinion on what this does in those jurisdictions who are currently using, calling it, I assume they're calling it personal property, putting it under the personal property category? Could you could you ask that question? Okay, so the, the counties who are not using the depreciation schedule, how are they taxing it? Is it under real estate or personal property? They're taxing it as real property. Okay. And they're vary as far as what sort of depreciation schedule they apply. They're all using original cost as a starting point, so there's uh -huh. different ways to appraise <coughs> property. Okay. Uh, so they're using a cost approach, and so they're starting with the original cost. And so the question is, how do you depreciate the value of those pipes over time? What depreciation schedule to apply? Uh -huh. So the counties that are not following the State Tax Commission's recommendations, generally speaking, are suggesting that the cost should be trended up, depreciated down, so that really there is no effective depreciation applied. So they're all using some kind of a depreciation schedule. They're just not using a uniform depreciation schedule. Well, they, they weren't always. So from 2013 through 2015, a few of the counties applied no depreciation at all, which was the subject of a couple of court cases, the Estes case, Adams and Elfring mm -hmm. cases, which is what I quoted from, the logically grounded language that I quoted from in my testimony. So that hasn't always been true. I don't know what those counties are doing, if they've fallen in line with Estes or not. Um, and, and of course, the, they decided to use a different depreciation schedule perhaps uh, for a, a good reason, maybe. Um, probably not the least of which is that whatever taxes that they remove from the u utility provider is going to get passed on either in additional um, personal property tax for the rest of the folks in the county or the real estate taxes, right? Would that be logical? So I, I can't speak as to why they chose the methodology that they did. What I, what I can say is the end result is that all of you, as ratepayers, are paying the tax. So this is not a tax relief bill for utilities, so to speak. Well, to well maybe, except, except I'm on LP, so, so I, I don't even well, get that benefit. But well, One reason why LP may not, I mean, I can understand the logic in taking LP out of it. It's not rate regulated. So... Mm -hmm. You know, the, the situation we have with the utilities is their rate is set. They don't get to choose how high of a rate they want to charge. It's set, and it's set on a multi-jurisdictional basis, county. So, so you have this situation where some counties are paying the other county's freight, so to speak. And you wouldn't have that in LP because there's no rate-regulated situation. There's no well, uniform uniformity among them. So I'm trying to think of what areas I'm assuming that the balance of this is probably – deals with natural gas that is privately held. So we're probably talking about maybe Laclede Gas in St. Louis or maybe city utilities in Springfield. I think I think there's five or six rate regulated utilities across the state. Okay. I, I don't know that I could name all five or six of them. Well but, I know I can't. It will impact I, them. It will impact them for sure. Okay. Now so obviously they're encouraging this because it saves them money, right? Well I mean, does it save litigation expenses that ultimately get passed on to consumers? Yes. Does it save? No, that wasn't a gotcha question. I'm yeah, just saying no, they're mean, encouraging it because there is a there is an ultimate cost savings, which we hope that they will pass along to their customers, um, and probably factors into a public service commission review of some kind. So those costs, when they when there's a rate case, those costs are are brought in and brought to the table, and the you know the PSC determines the rate based on many factors, mm -hmm. costs sure. being one of them. Yeah, no, it's not that I'm necessarily against. It. I'm trying to get a clear picture of what we're trying to do here. Sure. And and um, so I I I agree. Consistency is the key. I mean, we 
on personal property tax, the assessor uses in the NADA book, right? So if I'm buying a 2003 Chevrolet pickup in, in Kansas City, I'm paying the same taxes as somebody bought one in St. Louis based on the NADA value, right? To be clear on that, the, the statute, the 137-122 excludes motor vehicles, so, that, so that's probably not the best example. The example is business personal property, which there's a definition of that in the statute. These pipes would qualify as business personal property. Across the state since 2005 has been subject to a, a statutory depreciation schedule. And as a practitioner in this area, what I've noticed, because I have cases, most of them involve real property, some involve personal property, the litigation, like when you search the state tax commission cases, it's hard to find any more than 10 or 12 that deal with personal property because once the state and the legislature and the governor decided, let's get rid of all this litigation, let's, let's set the rules up front so you can predict what your costs are gonna be years down the road, um, that's worked out really well. Um, the suggestion here is that we apply these pipes to that same statutory formula, not just because we want to, but because it makes sense for one, the type of property we're talking about, but for the legislative change in 91, which tagged on this as real property, it's, it's not unusual or strange to suggest that this type of property is personal property. It, it is, but for the statutory language that exists now, it's, it's pipes. It's a, it's a piece of pipe. Well, no, I so can... It makes logical sense I, to do that. I actually understand how that can happen because it's been the tradition of... of um, assessors to anything attached to the property becomes real estate. So I, I understand how that works. No, I, I don't have any problem with what you're trying to do there. Like I said, my example of the NADA book was that we use a consistent source throughout the state of Missouri and, and as the base value of something, right? So I, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, the only concern I've got really is, <clears throat> and maybe my counties are already doing what you're suggesting, and so they might not have the situation, I'll talk to my assessors, but of, of how that, that reduction in revenue gets offset. I mean, that's the only concern I think that my constituents would have. So if I've got that question satisfied, I'm probably okay. Yeah, and, so. and one thing to point out that I didn't mention is by, by making the change to personal property from real property, the assessment ratio increases. So you all get your house assessments, you know, the, there's a different ratio for real estate than there is for personal property. For commercial, real estate is 32%. For business, personal property, it's 33 and a third. So in fact, when you look at the actual assessed value of all this property, it's going to go up. Yeah, but your clients wouldn't be doing it if there wasn't no overall cost savings. But here let's, it is. let's just face that. <laughs> but here it is. It, it's the consistency and the uniformity for a rate regulated utility is I very important. You. So that's really the driving force right. behind this. I and got no problem with it. If you guys save money in the process, I'm okay with that. But we're, we're not going to suggest that somehow this is a, a, a – a, that, that there's not a, a, a motive here that involves the, the, the providers, which I have no problem with. I love to save money on taxes anywhere I can, too. Well, they so. also save money on me, so I'm talking myself out of a job. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, well, hey, I'm all for it then, right? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kidding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Riggs. Tim Quar. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one question. How many counties are not using uniform assessments? So that, that's, that's tough because it changes. So when the litigation started in 2013, I want to say, and again, I, I can't say this is true. I know I'm testifying under oath here, so I, this is just my, my guess and my recollection is I'm going to say across the state 20 initially, 20. And that's an approximate guess. I think that number has been reduced because I think there's been some resolutions along the way where a number of those counties have gone to makers. I, I know of one specific that I was involved in. So that number is certainly less now, um, but I can't tell you the exact number. Right. But it's in that, in that range, 20 or less. Thank you. And the way to say this, to the best of my knowledge, information, and belief. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any further discussion? Representative Piper? Yes, to inquire. Thank you. Um, Proceed. 
I have just some really basic questions. Liquid to me means any kind of liquid. So we're talking about water as well as uh, petroleum projects, products? It's not not petroleum. Petroleum is not included okay, in Okay, natural gas. It's, and I don't have the language in front of me, but it's natural gas, water, and sewage are what's included. Okay. So, um, for example, in my district, we have a municipal water company. How would my group be affected, my district? So I don't know what that utility municipal water district is doing now. Chances are they're probably following the state tax commission form, which has been sent out, which sets forth the depreciation schedule that we want to be put in the statute. So if they are, then it would be no impact to them at all. Okay, so a municipal water system, for example, is not tax exempt when looking at personal property tax? Well, that's a good question. I, I'm not, I wasn't thinking about that. So okay. if they're tax that, exempt, then it's, it's no... Yeah, that, I, I don't know. I mean, that... If, I would say they're not. They're not tax... They're, they are tax exempt, so it would have zero okay. impact on them. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. Any further questions for this way? Representative Broden? Jim Barr. Proceed. So by moving to the to the personal property tax, business personal property tax, it creates the depreciation. Am, am I understanding that correctly? So so, so the, the by, pipes by, would by be... By changing the classification, by changing the classification to personal property, by statute, biz, all business personal property, no matter what it is, that fits within the, that definition, which this property would, automatically slides into Section 137, 122, which sets forth a depreciation schedule that's okay. in the statute. Okay. Does that answer so, your question? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes or no. I'll probably suffice <laughs> on that as a very lawyer answer. So, uh, But thank you. Um, so the next question then is, how do they assess the pipes then themselves? And what happens when the business turns around and, and adds in, say, 20, new, 20 feet of new pipe uh, that they d – does – do they go back to a higher rate for that 20 section? I mean, I'm trying to figure out how the calculation would be done for all these pipes that are being replaced on a sure. common. So a brand, let's say you they spend $1,000 on a brand new pipe. Okay. The very first year that pipe's in the ground, they pay a, a tax based on the cost, which is the original cost of $1,000, and there will be no depreciation in the first year because it's brand new. The next year, the depreciation percentage drops down. So the, the, the amount of cost that would be taxed would be 9 So this is in addition to the whatever sales tax would be on that pipe, wherever they were Sales they bought tax, it. this has nothing to do with sales tax. Okay, so, so this requires them to actually report that they spent $1,000 on a new pipe in, in with, Cape Girard County or some other county. Correct, which, which they do already. That's, okay. That's how, that's how um, at least for the natural gas industry, that's how... Um, property tax is calculated. It's based on cost less depreciation. Okay. Uh, do you know how much money the utilities would save by going to this personal property tax I do uh, not. depreciation? What what kind of impact this guy have for some of the clients out there? I, I do not. Okay. I'm sure I think we have some more people we got to testify in support of it, so maybe I'll ask them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further questions for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you very much. For testifying and any other witnesses that support House Bill 2208? All right. All right. Please state your name. Mr. Chairman, and, members of the committee, for the record, Larry Ployce with Spire, Missouri Natural Gas, the old Eclid. We serve, uh, I would call the eastern and western seaboard, mostly of Missouri, uh, um, with 1.1 million customers. Um, I'll make a couple of comments here and answer a couple of questions. Um, in the natural gas industry, specifically as the dominant player or predominant player in the state of Missouri, we've been undergoing a massive infrastructure program. So the, the, the net tax income from almost every county we serve, depending on what year you talk about, has been going up. Because to your question, Representative Roden, that number resets to that higher original cost. So we're taking out stuff that's been mostly depreciated out and replacing it. So our tax bills have been going up. It, we are down to four counties, it's my understanding, uh, in dispute over this since 2013. And, 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 I, in, and in that process, lots of appeals monies, lots of tax dollars to the, to, to the, to the uh, 
Mr. Landwehr's comment earlier. And it's been, always been about standardization and consistency with this. I have not heard of any sticker shock, and maybe some people can come up here from the counties and represent sticker shock that they experienced when they, they switched over, if they did, from the real property assessment, and I'm not a tax expert, but to personal property. So I'm, I'm not aware of that. It may have happened. I will tell you from our perspective, I don't see our tax basis going down. It will continue to go up to the counties we serve as we, as we continue to replace, you know, some cases, 100-year-old pipe and move forward with that. I participated with a couple of counties a couple of years ago where we've tried to come up with some type of hybrid model to address this particular niche, if you will, water, uh, gas, and sewer pipe. And everywhere we looked to try to come up with that hybrid model, we kind of ended up with a dead end. When you start looking at customers per mile, or you start looking at value, or you start looking at net income, we just came up to a dead end. Or we came up with sticker shock, where some counties went boom, and some went boom. On any type of on any type of methodology change, this method over the several years we've been looking at it seems to be the most consistent, and I think we're we're down to four out of forty some counties or more that we serve. I think the number is under ten, but I'd, I'd hate to say that in our oath. I think I think that's about where we are um, in the process since 2013. Um, I think he's covered the rest of it pretty well. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Representative Mayhew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you said there's 10 counties. I, I think we're around 10. We are at, we're at four. Okay. It's, do you know the your four right off the top of your head? I think I've got three or four. I think it's, I think it's Clay, Platt, and I think it might be St. Genevieve. St. Francis. Uh, St. Francis. I guess I do know now with support from the audience. Okay, well, that's... Uh, <laughs> I mean, without being too territorial, that's quite a ways away from me. Um, but I would love to see um, a list of those 10 at some point from whoever can provide that. Um, no need in going through that list right now. Um, so uh, Representative Roden brought up an interesting thing that uh, kind of made me think about this. What I, I, there, We have several counties where in our state that don't require a building permit or any of those things, gas doesn't require a permit from the Department of Natural Resources to install. So when pipe is replaced, what's your notification process to the county? Is that voluntary? You send them a letter at the end of the year that says, oh, by the way, we replaced 8,000 foot of pipe in, in Jones Township or whatever. How, how, what, how's that work? I, I do not know exactly, but I my recollection in conversation with the counties is what you just said is a pretty accurate. We send them information as to what activity took place in their county. If we removed a regulator station or some type of pressure system, um, and we would we would update that. So so it's voluntary. I, I guess that's the term. Uh, I mean, you would you know, there's no law. Or or anything that would require you I, to do I, that. I have to defer on whether the counties require that every year. I don't uh, know. So I know that some wouldn't. Uh, I mean, I don't even know that they would, if, especially if they're not using this new depreciation schedule, they probably wouldn't know to even ask for it. I, I'm guessing. Perhaps an assessor is here and they can speak to that a lot better than me. I'm just not aware of a process in a rural county where they would, you know, call you guys up or uh, or insist on it. When I fill out my assessment form at the end of the year, it doesn't say anything about the number of feet of sewer pipe right. that I have or whatever, right? Now, the other question I had, and you probably can't answer this, but I hope somebody in, in the audience can, is is that when I think about sewer, sewer and water especially, the only time I can think of that this law would come into play for those is in situations where the assets – of a particular city have been transferred to a private operator. And in most of those cases, I'm not even sure that they transfer those assets. They more or less allow them to use and maintain. But but I'm not, I hope somebody in, that's going to testify later on can testify to that. Because I can, I, I can see some issues, public versus private property, and how that converts in in this thing. But like I said, I, I'll probably have to 
discover this offline, but if somebody is in the audience it's going to testify to that, please make note of the question. Um, other than that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't see any, I'm aware of um, several natural gas lines around. I'm, I don't know why we can't be consistent on how we tax those. We are with everything else. The railroads that cross here, you know, there's a consistent rate that's divided up between those folks that have railroads in their counties. And so I'm, I'm okay with trying to provide some consistency in this. I'm, the only other question I had was the one I had earlier is how this affects the bottom line in the counties that are using a different system. So I'm, I'm, that may not be mine. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Manlove. Thank you. Just a quick inquiry. Um, Proceed. Thank you. Um, so kind of thinking of going back to like the process. So he said, how are they notified? And I know a lot of times like you guys had to apply for a permit to do it. So there's somebody's tracking that you're already doing it. So I get that part. Um, who is it? Is it Spire specifically has done a lot of pipe work in Kansas City? Correct. Um, is that the spire relay that concrete, or who do I need to fuss at for relaying the concrete over the pipes? <laughs> That's uh, doing you a ter with me. terrible job. Yeah. Terrible job. Yeah. I, I need somebody to work on that. We're going to have more potholes. So th thank you. <laughs> You've done a lot of work in your city, but please direct those to me. Will do. Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions? The only thing I uh, question that I have is. Uh, I, and I'm assuming if you go to this standard table, uh, kind of, you know, has the representative pointed out like they have with the NADA or any of those on, on uh, personal property, uh, the assessor uh, will be able to do this uh, appraisal themselves. They won't have to hire anybody from outside to come in and, do, and uh, establish the value, I'm assuming, unless there would be a tax protest or something that would... Uh, be encountered uh, because of not maybe not agreeing with the assessed valuation that that has been placed on that property. I'm assuming there's some type of dispute resolution process, but I I defer that to somebody else exactly on how that would be handled. Okay. If that's your question, I'm sorry. Yeah. Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you for testifying. Do I have any further witnesses in favor of House Bill 2208? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Christine Page, and I'm here on behalf of Missouri American Water, an investor-owned utility that serves about one in four Missourians with either water or wastewater service throughout the state. Um, this is not a, a major issue for us. We um, Do you have your mic on? I'm sorry. It, it, it is on. I'm, okay. I'm Should be green. It, it was. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, oh, now it's working. Um, <laughs> we do provide service in... 24 counties throughout the state. Um, 23 of them are already on this 20-year depreciation schedule, so it, it's not um, a major change for us. Um, the, the county for us that is deviated from that is Platte County, which is one of the ones that Spire mentioned as well. So I'm not helping you, Representative Mayhew, get to your 10, but um, there's some consistency there. Um, we're really just looking for something to be consistent across the state. Um, this is not to get out of paying taxes. Our tax bill goes up every year just like Spires because we are replacing 70, 80, 100 year old pipe in the ground. Uh, but we would like to see it consistently done. The way our rates are set is that we do have large customer groups. And so we have St. Louis County on one rate group and then everybody else that we serve throughout the state on another rate group. So you could have, um, if you have an apartment or, or house here in Jefferson City and you pay a Missouri American Water Bill, you're actually then paying for that higher um, tax bill from Platte County as well. So we're just, again, looking for that consistency throughout the state. Okay, thank you. Do I have any uh, inquiries? Uh, Representative Mayhew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You uh, were the guys percent. I had exactly in mind on the water and sewer. So those, the, in some of these communities, and probably in most, there were public assets that you took over. So was that, those the those assets were transferred to Missouri American? So it's a, a purchase sale, so, um, and the community has to, the city council puts it on the ballot and voters vote to sell their water and or sewer system to us. Um, and then once that's um, approved by voters, it goes to the Public Service Commission for review and approval as well before it can be transferred over to us. 
so those components, including the pipe that's in the public right of way, were transferred to yes. Missouri. Okay. Yep, and um, they've been operating in Missouri for uh, 140 years. Our original system was purchased in St. Joseph, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you have Joplin too, right? Mm -hmm. We do. Okay, um, plus a number of others. Um, so then, then you guys um, have a program. I know because I've talked to your employees before of of um, pipe replacement yes. and, and so upgrading systems all the time. So do you all have a notification system that you use with the county assessor on the new I, I believe assets? that the tax attorney mentioned that it was statutorily required. Um, I am not a tax expert, but um, I believe that there is a requirement for that that's not voluntary. Okay, so, it's, so there's some form that they prepared for you to report that. On oh okay I would well so. and that's consistent in all 114 counties right. and city of St Louis. I would imagine so. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank oh, you. And then um, Representative Roden had mentioned an issue about um, you know savings for utilities. I mean, once we go in for a rate case or a rate review process, um, the property tax is essentially just a, a pass through to our customers. We're not making any money on that. If there were, were to be a tax change between rate cases. Um, you know, those additions or like, you know, savings could potentially be picked up by the utility, but Representative Searpoy actually had a bill voted out of commerce um, bipartisanly this morning, Senate Bill 745, I believe it was, that would establish a property tax tracker and Representative Bromley just filed it in the House yesterday. So that would ensure that um, any like savings from this bill would flow back to customers after the next rate case. Yeah, so thank you, I need to that. end my inquiry. Thank you very much, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Briggs, to inquire. Uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What is the Platte County deviation? I believe that they are on a 37 and a half year depreciation schedule instead of a 20 year schedule. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Broden. Briefly. Uh, to inquire. Proceed. Um, so, on the, the in between the tax rates set, when they look at the tax rate or for the, the next um, increase or whatever. Uh, rate that they're going to set. Uh, is that looked at it per individual county or as an overall as a company in the state of Missouri? So it, it's allocated based on the rate groups, but it's always looking bat, back at like a snapshot in time. So they look at what's called a test year and they look at the property taxes during the test year. And then that goes into the cost of service and the revenue requirement used to determine rates. Was that for everybody or for just that? Or do they go up by county by county to, to look at that snapshot? So if, if I'm understanding what you're asking, I mean, they, they take a look at what is being charged in each county, but then that's rolled up. And so like in our last rate review, they decided to have two rate groups. So St. Louis County customers are in one rate group, and then all of our other customers throughout the state are in that second rate group. So that's why I was saying you could okay. be living in St. Charles County or here in Jefferson City, but you would be lumped in with those costs from Platte County. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me uh, ask you a question. If, through all of the uh, utilities that you provide in, in uh, different uh, distinct locations, have you run into on your ass uh, assessments with the assessor any, uh, uh, have you had protested uh, bill, uh, rates, bills that uh, for our over, what figure over assessment or? Are you asking if like we've paid property taxes you, under no, protest? No, well or? under the, the, the taxes have, have any of the, uh, have the entities, which would be yourself, have you protested taxes in any of the communities that you provide water service to? I believe that we did have legal proceedings with Platte County that were settled. Okay. Is that your question? Yes, okay. yes, yes. I was just wondering what, because, you know, I'm kind of getting, what I'm getting at, you know, I had asked the, the gentleman before if, you know, the assessor is going to have to do, have some, uh, professional help, you know, appraisers that will actually establish the value to place it on the books. And, you know, at times uh, when people disagree with their valuation, uh, they have the right uh, under 140 to uh, protest those taxes. So I was just inquiring on that. If you had encountered, your company had encountered any of those situations. So thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for testifying. Do I have any other witnesses to testify in favor of House Bill 2208? Please state your name 
and you can proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Trey Davis, president and registered lobbyist for the Missouri Energy Development Association. We represent Missouri's largest investor-owned utilities that provide electric, natural gas, and water and wastewater services to over a, um, well over half of all Missourians. So when we talk about uniformity and consistency and how that impacts Missouri, back to a previous question, you've heard from Spire, Missouri American Water. This would also impact customers and service territories um, that are served by Amherst, Missouri, Liberty Utilities, as well as Summit Natural Gas. So it it's encompasses a large majority of the state, um, and so I think anything you all can do to provide that updated consistency and uniformity would be appreciated. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, do we have any inquiries for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for testifying. Uh, do I have any other witnesses? And also, I want to remind everybody that, you know, we are time limited. Uh, and so I'd like to, for the witnesses to, if you have new information, provide that. Otherwise, you can always uh, submit it to us and it will be uh, placed in the record. So uh, state your name and proceed. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Ray McCarty, president of Associated Industries in Missouri, wanted to go on record and support this. Actually, um, I was also told to answer your question. Uh, there is a list that goes out to the businesses from the county assessors, and it says this is what we have as your, as your business personal property, and then you can add to or subtract from that. So it is a voluntary reporting system subject to audit. Um, so they can audit it if they don't believe it's correct. But that's how it's done every year. You update your list, kind of like we do with our vehicles when you get your personal property statements. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens for business personal property, and this would make sure that that happens with, with these other types of, of property. I have uh, Representative Mayhew. I, too, fill out the same form every year. Yes. I just don't remember there being a line item for pipe. Well, there's not. Or it's, size it's of pipe. Or, it's a different form for businesses than it is for Oh, I'm, I have a business. Or. I'm a business owner. Okay. So I, I just, like I said, I'm, I, maybe I'm not looking for it. Well, maybe it's here. you don't have pipe now, so that's why well, it doesn't I don't have pipe list. now. Oh. Don't want any either. Right. So it's, <laughs> I got enough trouble with four vehicles. So it's, so thank you. All right. Uh, any further questions for this witness? Thank you Thank for you. testifying. Do I have any other witnesses to testify in favor of House Bill 2208? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, Ross Lean with the Missouri Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, I'll just echo what's already been said and happy to support, happy to take any questions. Uh, any que questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you for testifying. Do I have any further witnesses testify in favor of House Bill 2208? Do I have any witnesses here to testify who oppose to House Bill 2208? Seeing none, do I have any witnesses here to testify for informational purposes only? Please state your name and begin when you're ready. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Michael Grote, registered lobbyist, appearing on behalf of Boone County, Missouri. Uh, we are one of the counties that, you meant, that you've heard mentioned uh, that is currently using a different rate, um, have talked to some of the parties involved in this and are definitely looking for a, a solution. Uh, as, as I think you heard from the very first witness, this has been ongoing litigation. It's costly to uh, our utilities providers as well as to the various counties involved. So we definitely need to come up with a solution uh, that, that addresses both issues. I've uh, talked to Mr. Ployce a couple times, trying to come up with a couple of ideas. I don't, I don't think we're there yet. Um, but we're looking at central assessment or, or something like that as we've done with some other entities here in the state to try to come up with something that works both for the counties involved as well as for um, the utilities. And that way everyone knows what the rate is, can, can base upon it and uh, have consistency and, and uh, a known uh, quantity. So look forward to working with the sponsor to try to figure that out. I want to just answer a couple of the questions since it was brought up. Uh, we have one utility that is currently in the, in the process of doing replacement. Uh, extensively in Boone County. Uh, our law, we believe our loss on that alone would be roughly about two million from that one one utility alone. I'm trying to get more complete numbers to your questions, Representative Mayhew, as to what the total cost would be. We see that cost as then shifting over um, to the other uh, uh, 
personal property taxpayers in the county. So finding a solution that works for everybody is, is what we're interested in. Like I said, we're interested in working with the bill sponsor and uh, our fabulous utilities that are here in the room to try to come up with that solution. Thank you. Do I have any inquiries? Uh, Representative Mayhew. You said the difference would be $2 million? Uh, there's currently a very large uh, pipe replacement project going on in um, Boone County. And, and that's what we see from that one utility, yes, sir. But I will that, get you more accurate numbers. I've asked more accurate numbers. I apologize. I don't have them at this Is time. that gas? Uh, it is, yes, sir. And and um, did you know right off the top of your head the customer base for that I, I utility? I apologize, sir. I do not, but I will find that information. Uh, well, I mean, you. what I'm driving at is to get the $2 million on on pipe is, I mean, there that must be a pretty different depreciation schedule that they're using because I'm, you know, I realize Boone County is a big place, but, you know, that sounds, that sounds extreme, $2 million. I'm, I, that's what I'm saying. I'd and, I, and I think the depreciation schedule is our, is our biggest concern, I mean, essentially since the depreciation is based upon uh, the original cost, not the replacement value cost. And so just trying to figure out how that would work. Well, if I'm understanding correctly, they're submitting when they do one of these new projects you're talking about, it's just the depreciation schedule difference is what we're arguing about, right? I mean, what they're arguing about with you. We have now left the realm of which I am intelligent enough to speak okay, on. Okay, fair enough. I apologize I, for It that. just seems to me a big difference, $2 million, when all we're talking about is ca the calculation of the depreciation doesn't seem like you'd be that far off. Just curiosity. And like I said, let me. I, I want to get better numbers and make sure that okay. what my assessor has reported to me, and that way we can share it with everybody in the room. And like I said, our, our goal is to find a solution and not not be a problem. Okay. Like this. And thank you. And once again, it was curiosity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion for this witness? Seeing none. Thank you for testifying. And that will conclude the hearing on House Bill. 2208. Next, we will hear HJR 125. And uh, again, I'm going to emphasize that we are limited on time. And so I'm requesting that we kind of hold our uh, uh, comments and everything to a, a limited time. I haven't placed a time on everybody yet, but if we need be, I will. So uh, with that, Representative, state your name and Begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Phil Cristinelli from the 105th District here to present House Joint Resolution Number 125. Uh, this this is a pretty pretty easy one as well. Uh, it's actually far more simpler than the last the last one. So uh, this adds to our Constitution a uh, a cap on income taxes, and the cap proposed uh, in this bill is five uh, five point nine. Right now we are at 5.4, so that is um, uh, 0.5 above uh, where we're at currently. Um, and there's a principle in tax policy that uh, our goal is to have a income tax that is as, as low as possible and, uh, as, and a, a tax policy that spreads the tax burden across as many fields as we can. So we have a, a low, fair, and, and, and flat uh, tax regime. Uh, and so the other thing that this bill does is it modifies a, um, a provision that was, that was introduced to the Missouri Constitution uh, about five years ago, uh, which uh, says that there can be no sales tax on services, and it provides an exception uh, to that, uh, that exemption uh, that, it, that carves out uh, subscription to licenses, digital licenses for digital products and online purchases of tangible personal property. And the goal there uh, is uh, to envision what the, what the modern economy looks like. Much of the economy is moving in the direction of, of those type of, of uh, services and products. And um, I think Missouri should be able to uh, create a, a, a taxing system that could, in the future, focus on taxing uh, those type of, of products through sales 
and uh, ultimately lowering uh, the pressure on our income tax. Because as you know, members of the committee, uh, an income tax is a tax on productivity. We want to encourage productivity through our taxing system and uh, focus, focus taxation on areas like uh, consumption, in my view. Uh, and so that is why we have uh, introduced this bill. It would be a constitutional amendment voted on uh, by the people, and I'm happy to entertain any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you, uh, Representative. Uh, um, now, built into the, uh, into, the, into the code right now, into the Missouri statutes, of course, we'll have an automatic uh, one-tenth of a percent for 23 because of the Wayfair bill. That's right. We're, we're going in the other direction, yeah. And then, and then after that, we still have uh, two more in there if uh, gross receipts top $150 million in any, uh, you know, in, in a year averaged over for the last three years. Okay. That's right. So, so w we do have something built in there you, uh, as far as right now that is reducing our tax rate, but you know, it's not to say it couldn't go up in the in the future uh, with future legislators. That's right. But um, and then the other question I have, because on uh, exempting the uh, uh, purchases of tang tangible personal property, uh, that's pretty wide scope. Tangible sure. personal property, because if you look under uh, Section One, under the uh, either uh, One uh, Thirty Seven, uh, One Twenty Two. Uh, you know, it, it kind of talks uh, are uh, under 137, 115, uh, where it defines uh, our, uh, I apologize, uh, 137.010, which defines uh, personal, pro uh, tangible personal property. And, you know, you can buy a lot of things online. Uh, so is there any, and what I'm exist, uh, talking about is, is right now, I mean, you can order a car online. <laughs> And so your bill wouldn't exempt the taxes on that particular piece of property, or you can order big screen TVs or ice boxes or, you know, appliances. My so bill doesn't exempt anything from taxes, to be clear. What it does is it exempts certain categories of, of products and services from the prohibition of taxes that was introduced in the Missouri Constitution on services or, or transactions that were not subject to, to sales tax on that date. So that was a provision that was entered to the Constitution. We are providing an exception so that the legislature in the future could have the option of taxing those type of things in hopes of ultimately lowering our state income tax. Okay. Uh, Representative Pfeiffer? Yes, um, a couple Please. questions. Uh, I, I am assuming that currently uh, the legislature can set the income tax rate, correct? Can, yes. Okay. Why put this in the Constitution then? Uh, because I would like for our state to move in a direction uh, towards eliminating our, our income tax. Okay. Uh, Thank you. For the Again. reasons that we, we discussed earlier. And so, and so this is a philosophical issue for you? Uh, well, I, I think it's a policy issue insofar as uh, I believe that we should strive to tax consumption over productivity. Yeah. Uh, I, and I'll, I'll say that it's not particularly a partisan issue. This, this bill passed out of the Senate Tax Committee, I believe. Um, somebody else can, can testify to that, but I think it was seven to one. Um, if I read this correctly um, and, and listening to you, um, in a sense, you're... you're, you're taking away with one hand and giving with the other. I'm giving the legislature more latitude to tax certain types of things than other types of things, yes. Okay. Um, I think I really disagree with the first part, probably disagree with the second part, but thank you. Any further inquiries for this witness? Thank you. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, Representative Manlab, I'm sorry. I did not see you. Raise your hand there. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, just so one more clarification. So you are that that second paragraph says that pending this passes, those things can be potentially taxed. Because, that's right. Okay, that's why I want to make sure. Thank you. Any further inquiries? Thank you, Representative. And uh, do I have any one in favor of House Bill 
our HJR 125. Seeing none, do I have anyone that opposes HJR 125? Seeing none, do I have anyone here for informational purposes only on, how, on HJR 125? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing on HJR 125. Next, we will hear House Bill 2200. Uh, Representative, you can come forward, state your name, and proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, Brad Hudson, State Representative, District 138. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation for you being patient with me as I tried to uh, uh, work on a very busy day. I had a bill that I presented in another committee that was meeting at the same time as this one, so thank you for allowing me to, to come in late and present at this time. Uh, my bill, uh, what it would do is it would change uh, part of the Missouri Circuit Breaker program. Uh, the term circuit breaker actually derives its name from an electrical circuit breaker that uh, shuts off uh, the current when a system is overloaded. And so what we, are, what we have in Missouri is we have a program that would allow individuals who too much of their income is having to go to property taxes would allow them some relief. Property taxes, uh, when you uh, maintain your home, uh, that uh, oftentimes those values increase as assessments are uh, performed. Uh, they, they don't oftentimes go down. Uh, whereas if you have other situations in life, say maybe you reach a certain age and you're on more of a fixed income or something happens to you, you're 100% disabled, that sort of thing, and that would uh, affect your ability to uh, gain income, uh, those things uh, can change the amount of taxes you have to pay because you're not making as much income. However, property taxes are a little bit of a different animal. And so right now in Missouri, we have a program that allows individuals to have a, uh, they, they pay their property taxes, so we're not dealing with anything that would uh, keep folks from paying their taxes to their local taxing jurisdictions. But then for individuals that qualify, uh, they are given a Missouri state tax credit. And they can file their taxes and they can receive uh, a all or a portion, depending upon the numbers of their property taxes, back if they qualify. Now, there, is, uh, there are some income guidelines on this, and they haven't been changed in quite some time. Uh, we all know the purchasing power of a dollar is not the same today as it was you know, a number of years ago. And so what I'm trying to do is uh, I wanted to make a real simple change here. Now, in this building, we know that uh, sometimes when we think something simple, it ends up being a bit more complicated. Uh, so I have great respect and appreciation for the folks uh, that work on this floor that have helped me with this issue and uh, anyone else that would like me to, to help me as we continue to try to draft something that would work well, uh, uh, to get something that would work well, rather, I'd be happy to have you uh, come aboard. What I want to do is I want to increase the maximum amount of income that an individual can earn and qualify, and I also want to tie that to CPI so we don't have to have uh, this discussion. This body doesn't have to necessarily have this discussion again like this. That's basically, in a nutshell, for the most part, what I'm trying to do anyway. Be happy to take any questions if you have any. Representative Pipe. Um, good afternoon. I really like this bill. Uh, I, I, we talked about this on the floor last year, this, this idea. And I, I went and looked in um, the state website uh, about the Circuit Breaker program. It sounded like it's kind of moribund. Is, is it working right now? Uh, so let me make sure that I, well, first of all, I want to say I, I appreciate your positive comments about my bill. And uh, yes, I do think I remember this was brought up on the floor uh -huh. last year. And I being a former assessor, I have, uh, I've been that guy that stands up on the floor when somebody's trying to do something that sounds good. And I've explained why this may not work out as well as you think it does. So I wanted to try to get something done that, uh, that would help individuals uh, with property tax relief. Um, and so, so your question was basically, is, is it working now? I mean, is it, is it operational basically? Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that, cause I, I couldn't get a real sense in the, you know, 20 minutes of research I did last year, um, if, if this is something that is up and going, because it just makes all the sense in the world as far as I'm concerned. It, it, is, it is up and going, and I would like to tweak it where more folks could qualify. Thank you. So. 
Rep Representative Badlope. There we go. Okay. Proceed. Thank you. Um, yes. Yes. Um, and I, I, I think I see somebody who might be testifying in support of this bill uh, in the back as well. So um, I think that uh, this is something that I wanted to do. But, you know, I'm a Democrat, so I'm glad somebody who's passing a bill can take it over. And um, let's also work through the appropriations process to make sure, because I think that's one of those ones that's as appropriated for. So let's well, double you. team Thank on you that. for your comments, Representative. I, I appreciate that. Representative Goldman. Uh, to inquire. Proceed. Thank you. Hi, Representative. Hello, Representative. How are you today? I you am know well. that this is near and dear to my heart, so Sir. I appreciate you bringing this to the table. Um, I do have a question. I didn't get an opportunity because I'm running back and forth. Uh, what, who does this affect again? Well, what we're, what we're dealing with primarily are individuals that are 65 or older, uh, and individuals that are 100% disabled. Okay. So it would not affect lower income under age 65? You, you have to fall within the income guidelines, and you also have to meet one of those criteria right. that I mentioned. Or there's, and there may be one or two other things representative, like, uh, for example, you might have an individual that uh, uh, is, is, uh, has, is a surviving spouse. I think the age goes down a little bit on that. But there, there are qualifications beyond just the income. Kind of the Social Security levels of things, you know, in a way. Because Social Security... To your point, if you have a spouse, a surviving spouse on Social Security, they could be less than 65. Um, that could then, what you're saying, could still qualify for this. I, Social Security may not be a good example, but it kind of, in my world, <clears throat> helps me to understand when that could be a lower age level. Because they don't qualify other than those special circumstances like that if they're not under 65. The income levels are not affected. The income levels do not affect whether they qualify for this. The main issue is going to be the age and then the income levels come into play. That I, I would not argue with that. I mean, Representative, someone like me, it doesn't matter how low my income level is, I'm not going to qualify. Right. Um, so, you know, like I said, primarily we're dealing with individuals that are um, uh, 65 and older, uh, also 100% disabled. And now they don't have to meet, I'm not saying they have to meet both of those. No. But you can have right. an individual that is not of the age, but is 100% disabled, and if they meet the income guidelines, qualify. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's what I needed. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate your passion for this subject. Yes. Uh, uh, that, you know, on the, on the circuit breaker, because that's kind of the official name of it, uh, it's, uh, yes, it's 65 or older or 100% disabled. And, uh, you know, whenever you do the uh, M Missouri uh, PTC uh, to figure this out, it's, uh, you know, all of your income counts on this uh, uh, towards that limit, for, towards that threshold. And if you exceed it, obviously, you don't qualify for it. So do I have any further questions? See none? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, do I have uh, any witnesses here in favor of House Bill 2200. And again, I'm going to iterate because of our time here, because I, I have another bill. So I'm, I would like for you to kind of stick to the point and, and make it a couple of minutes, and that way uh, we can get through this without uh, running over. <laughs> Sounds good. I will be as quick as possible. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Jay Hardenbrook. I'm the advocacy director for AARP here in Missouri. We're a social change organization with a membership of over 750,000 members. Okay, so um, the circuit breaker for a long time has been a really valuable thing for this state. It, in fact, went into effect before I was born, um, back in, uh, in the 1970s. And w with the number one issue we hear about from our members is property taxes. Um, the assessments go up faster than their income does. Sometimes their income doesn't go up at all. I'm sure you've heard from this, heard about this from your constituents as well. 
So we have worked with many legislators on different ways to deal with that issue. Uh, sometimes you come back to the simplest way to do it, and that's what Representative Hudson has done. Uh, basically, just take the homeowner's section of that circuit breaker or the pop property tax credit and increase the minimum, increase the maximum. Makes all the sense in the world, especially leading into reassessments uh, next year. So happy to answer any questions, but I also want to be cognizant of the time. Do we have any questions for this witness? Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank, Thank you, so you for testifying. Do I have any other witnesses that support House Bill 2200? Seeing none, do I have any in opposition to House Bill 2200? Seeing none, do I have any witnesses for informational purposes only on House Bill 2200? Seeing none, that concludes the hearing for House Bill 220. We will now go back into executive session. And uh, let me get my numbers here, just one second. Okay, uh, I, uh, I move that House Bill 2527 be voted due pass. Any discussion? Seeing none, I have an amendment. It has been distributed, and I move for its adoption, and it's House Amendment 01H. Any discussion? And what I would like to do is I would like to have the sponsor come up and give us a very brief description of this amendment and what it does. So, Representative, uh, proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Um, could I request that I have Mr. Greg Smith explain it better than I can? Would he be allowed to explain it for me? Basically, if not, if that's not allowed, um, uh, no, you'll have to. Okay, you'll have okay. to explain it. Um, this this language was in the original bill last year that did pass unanimously through committee, and this limits um, a little bit of the parameters because some of these uh, facilities in the state of Missouri may not meet this threshold, and um, and or they do meet this threshold. I'm sorry, Greg, I'm, I'm doing a terrible job to explain that. Um, but anyway, it makes the bill better. Okay. Uh, would, would that be allowed? Or? Well, I think it, it has to be. Okay, it's the word licensing. That, that's the key word. Licensing, the word licensed on, on the second line there, uh, that, that is not applicable un under Missouri law. Okay. And so we need that basically the word licensed, but that whole part of that sentence removed, taken out Okay. All to right. make it proper verbiage. Okay. Thank you, Representative. I'm sorry. I have experts that tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, all those in favor of adopting the House Amendment 1. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 okay, it'll go, uh, pre so, yeah. proceed. So now I'm confused. The amendment would say they must be licensed or they may don't have to be licensed? Do not have to be licensed. Now, why is this not applicable to Missouri? Um, okay, so it's just the terminology. Under the Missouri Department of Health, they use the term certify, not license. So you still have to be certified under the state of Missouri and still follow all the state's regulations and rules, but they, there's not a terminology need that they're licensed, they're certified. So this is simply technical. There's Correct. There's not changing anything else. No, it's not changing um, the context of the bill itself. It's just making it... Um, kosher with with yeah. Department of Mental Health rules. Is it is it changing in any significant way the people uh, the the groups that would do um, the treatment? No, I mean, not so at anybody all. that would have been 
No, and I know Their we were rushed. We were last certified. last week on the agenda and time, and I think um, we could have fully explained that better. And I we had distributed this through an email, um, but nobody came to me in the last week uh, with any questions. But uh, again, uh, I'm not an expert in under all fields, so I have people that are. Right, I understand that completely. Thank you. I, I, I I'm just very reluctant to, to vote when I don't understand what's going Correct. on. Correct. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. Any further inquiries? Thank you, Representative. All those in favor of adopting House Amendment uh, 1 uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All those who oppose say no. The ayes have it. You have adopted the House Committee, uh, you have adopted the Amendment 1. I now move that we roll the amendment into a new substitute and the adoption, adopt the substitute and those in favor of sig by signifying by saying aye. aye. Those who oppose say no. The ayes have it, you have adopted the substitute. Chair, uh, I now move that House Committee substitute for House Bill 2527 be voted due pass. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Clerk, take the vote, please. Chairman McGurl? Aye. Vice Chair Lavasco? Representatives Bland Manlove? Aye. Coleman? Aye. Eggleston? Mayhew? Aye. Pfeiffer? Aye. Riggs? Roden, Aye. Weber. Aye. By your vote of eight to zero, you have voted House Committee substitute for House Bill 2527 do pass. And that will conclude the hearing for the Ways and Means. <laughs>